And Brent Hubbs joins us from VolQuest.com. Have you slept yet? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Not much. I, I, tell, I tell you, it was the, the post-game interviews for the media was nearly two hours after the game was over because it took oh. – I mean, to get the players and coaches off the field – uh, was its own set of challenges. And, of course, they had a bunch of recruits in and former players. So it, it was delayed there. And, and then there were so many storylines and angles from the scene following the win. Not not just the win itself, but the scene following the win. You don't see that every weekend in college football. And you haven't seen it in Knoxville uh, since Florida 1998. And uh, so there, there was a lot to write. There was a lot to, to dive through and then try to – decompress a little bit and get up and the next day and start all over again. So, um, yeah, it, it's been a wild 48, 72 hours in Knoxville for sure. And uh, the schedule for Tennessee is probably a good thing that they're playing UT Martin this weekend. How much of a relief did you feel from fans that something like that finally happened again? You know, that's a great point. And, 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 and I think that's probably the best way to describe it because when you see the overhead drone shot or the, limp shot, whatever that was there, there's this mass humanity of people on the field, right? Like here they're storming the field. But when they got to the field, it was just, it was like the largest gathering at an outdoor bar you've ever seen in your life. Like there was no running around and kind of pushing around and hopping and going crazy. There was just this almost moment of peace with thousands of people crammed together on the field of just relief and decompression and just a big exhale that they finally got to smoke the cigar they've been bringing to the stadium for 15 years and that they finally got the opportunity to just soak it all in it was the it was a kind of a surreal feeling on the field with all the fans out there they were happy and and don't get me wrong they were excited and it was vocal and and loud but it, it wasn't chaotic like you think it would be uh, when people rush the field like that, it was kind of once they got down there, it was like, do we have to leave? Really? You're telling us we got to go home because we just want to stay for a while. <laughs> so, Brent, take us through kind of what you were doing and your thoughts as that game, you know, wound to a close there. Well, I am uh, I'm with the university's radio uh, broadcast. I, I'm a spotter and and an analyst, so I, I bring us in and out of breaks and and I observe things and. Um, you know, work with our other color analyst, Pat Ryan, who's a former NFL player and former Tennessee player. When you get to that moment in a broadcast group, group I, I learned a long time ago from the great John Ward, you get out of the way. It's not your show. It's the play-by-play guy's show. So you just get out of the way. And um, so I'm just sitting there, and I'm waiting to see if Nick Saban's going to call his final timeout. He doesn't, uh, which was a surprise to me. Um, still dumbfounded at that point that Tennessee, that Alabama would give up an 18-yard completion and a 27-yard completion in 13 seconds to give Tennessee the opportunity to win it. And then, you know, he kicks the ball, and you're looking at it through the binoculars, and it's uh, – I've heard it described – you can describe it wherever you want to. It's the ugliest, most beautiful kick you'll ever see if mm-hmm. you're a Tennessee fan because it was – he took a false step. Um, it was kind of like he chunked a wedge if you're a golfer, <laughs> right? Like he chunked a wedge, and it bounced up close to the hole. And you're like, well, that was ugly, but it worked. And that was kind of what it was. I mean, it was just – he chunked it. He hit it fat, if you will, but it was just enough to get over the upright. And then your immediate reaction is, I can't believe they won. Now, you got to remember, I mean, the, the last seven trips by Alabama in the Neyland Stadium, the Crimson Tide's average margin of victory was 29 points. There had not been a competitive game in Knoxville – with Alabama since Tennessee beat Alabama in 2006. Now, Tennessee had a chance, Lane Kiffin's year in 09 with the Mount Cody block field in Tuscaloosa. Uh, Butch Jones had a lead with seven minutes to play in the fourth quarter in Tuscaloosa. Tennessee had played Alabama better in Tuscaloosa than they had in Knoxville. I mean, that place in Knoxville in years past was owned by Alabama in the last five minutes of the game because all the Tennessee fans had gone home because the game wasn't competitive. So to, to, to witness that and sit through that for that many years and the ball goes to the uprights, your first reaction is, holy crap, they won the game. And that's literally the reaction that, that I had, was just kind of like, 
heck fire, they won this thing. Like you were just waiting for the the next bad thing to happen. Remember, I'm on a radio deal. I, I was in Baton Rouge when Tennessee won, and then they dropped the flag for 13 men on the field, right? I, I was at the Music City Bowl when uh, North Carolina misses a field goal, and then there's a penalty, and it's on North Carolina. They back them up five yards. They get to kick it again, and the next year there's the 10-second runoff rule. Tennessee has won more games that way and ultimately end up losing them. So you're just kind of for a second, you're like, wait a minute, there's nothing bad getting ready to happen, right? And that's kind of how Tennessee fans were. It's why the it was I won't say a delay in the rush to the field, but there was just a pause of hesitation. Like it's good, right? There's nothing else going to happen here, and then it goes from there. So it, it was um, it was interesting to say the least. Well, Brent, that leads me into my question: in that Alabama usually with 16 seconds left on the clock, they're the ones who you left too much time for. And Hinden Hooker turned that completely on its ear. In fact, they did that exact thing to Auburn last year. Mm -hmm. uh, Hinden Hooker just turned it on its ear, didn't he? He did, and it starts with the head coach. Okay, this is the head coach doesn't believe in the victory formation. You're going to play every play for 60 minutes, right? I don't care if you got a 40-point lead. We're going to hand it off on the last play of the game. Um, you know, we, we may run out the clock. Is Josh Heupel's mentality, but we're not going to just take a knee and be done with it. And so – if if you followed him in his entire career, and of course, obviously, I've followed him close since he's been at Tennessee the last 18 months. When when they got the ball with 15 seconds, you knew Tennessee was going to take a chance down the field. They weren't going to, you know, see if they could pop a draw. I mean, they were throwing the football, uh, and they were going to let Hendon Hooker turn and let it rip. And Hendon Hooker averaged 18 yards of completion on a day he completed 70 percent of his passes against the Nick Saban secondary, which doesn't happen very often. And um, he made two he made two really good throws. The second throw, he had to get a little bit tall because pressure was coming. Brew McCoy makes a great play. There, there, you know, two seconds left. The timing on it was perfect. And, and here Tennessee is with a chance to win it. Hendon Hooker is going to be in New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony as a finalist. And uh, Josh Heupel's got him humming along in this offense right now. It's uh, If you like offense and you like, um, you know, you like points, Tennessee's a fun team to watch, even if you don't have a dog in the fight. Yeah, in line with that, uh, in awards, I mean, I would not be surprised to see uh, Jalen Hyatt heading to the uh, the Blitnikoff Award, given the the way that he, you know, performed. Uh, you know, not only Saturday but throughout. Uh, what did you make of his performance? He's he's arguably the best story on this Tennessee football team this season. If you go back to the middle part of last year, you would see Jalen Hyatt leaving the complex. He had a hoodie on. He had the hood up over his head. He had his ear, ear, earbuds in. His head was down. He never made eye contact with people. He boped in and out of the building. He was as unhappy as unhappy could be. And in the day and age of the transfer portal, the first thought you had as a media guy was, I need to make sure he's not going in the portal today. Because he wasn't playing a lot. Bayless Jones had taken his spot. Uh, he wasn't getting opportunities. And, and so you just, you know, in this day and age, you just didn't, weren't sure he was going to stay. Um he got to know Tennessee's new receivers coach, a guy named Kelsey Pope. He was an analyst last year. They developed a really good relationship. And then Bayless Jones, who's now with the Bears, had a conversation with Jalen right after the bowl game. And he said, everything is in front of you, Jalen, but you have to learn to go earn it. you got to be mature enough to go earn it. You can be a high NFL draft pick if you're willing to put in the work to go earn it. And it was like a light switch went off. It's like they flipped a switch. He, he immediately went to work. Um, he had a great spring. Everybody talked about how different his intensity was. 15,000 balls over the summer in the jugs machine that he caught. He's completely dialed in. He's a, he's on a prove-it mentality right now, and he's proven it each and every week with, with what he's been able to do in this offense. And he's got confidence that he's never had at Tennessee, and uh, he is off and running. It, 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 that performance Saturday uh, inside Neyland Stadium is is. You know, the best performance I've seen as a wide receiver. Uh, you, you, you know, it's a record-setting day. I believe, Brent, it's the most points Alabama's allowed in, like, since 1907. The 17 yes. penalties that Alabama had, we saw them almost uh, it cost them at, at, in Austin against Texas where they mm -hmm. somehow survived because of Bryce Young. It, 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 does it seem to be a team that's not disciplined? Because that would be almost everything against whatever Nick Saban preaches every day. Yeah, it's, it, the, I was watching Nick Saban's press conference today, and, and I was I was a little befuddled to hear him say, you know, my team played tight. We seemed 
antsy and tight coming into the coming into the game, and it's like really that's just uncharacteristic for them. Um, and, and the more uncharacteristic things, I know a lot of people are talking about pass interference calls, and he's talked about that. The thing that stands out to me, and you saw this against Texas, um, you saw it at times against Texas A and M. It's the self-inflicted stuff. You know, it's the lining up offsides. It's the illegal procedures, the false start penalties. Um, it's it's things that they have not that they've just not done under him. And I'm not I'm not in the camp that this guy suddenly lost it and all this stuff. But but for whatever reason, this team he's having a hard time getting this team to play with the edge. All of his teams seemingly have played with, and and I don't know have I don't have any idea why that's the case. I don't cover them on a daily basis, but to watch them you know, self-inflict and, and hurt themselves the way they did um, on Saturday uh, and not taking away anything from Tennessee, obviously. But that's just very uncharacteristic for them. You know, and they've been that way, you know, as you mentioned, throughout the year. I mean, Bryce Young bailed them out against Texas. And, you know, defensively they made a play at, at the end of the game against Texas A&M to, to win that game. Um, they are not your typical look at Alabama team right now. They don't play with that kind of edge. I, Will Anderson, Tennessee did a good job defending him, but he's not playing with the intensity he played with a year ago. I don't know the answer to why, but but they do look a bit different. Yes. Brent, appreciate it. Get some sleep. Um, uh, I can't even imagine the scene. It's probably like Mardi Gras hit Knoxville. That was special. That was special stuff <laughs> yeah, on Saturday. That, that was uh, – yeah, yeah there, there's there's not a lot of people who got to work on time today, and there's not a lot of people who got a lot of work done today for sure. So, yeah, it it, it was um, you know it's the beauty of college football, and 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 Tennessee and Neyland Stadium could be a great place when when their team is good. It's just been it's been a long time here to try to get that thing awake, uh, awoken, if you will, and and uh, it's wide awake right now with this football team. Paul, sure. I know you had another question. I said we don't have time, but one of the questions all three of us want to know. I know Tennessee's asking for donations to pay for the goalpost and all of that. Isn't that a little bit much that they're asking for money from the volunteer fans? Yeah, I think there was, and, and this is the this is kind of the downside to social media sometimes. There's some tongue in cheek in that. That that's not for now. They're taking donations for renovations to Neyland Stadium, but that's a three hundred million dollar project, right? They're not they're not sitting there going, we don't have the we don't have the money to write a check this week for go posts. So there was some <laughs> tongue in cheek in that. That it, it didn't go across anybody's tongue, and it didn't resonate off anybody's cheek. It it's it, it, it was. It, it did not come off very well because there's a lot of national people going. Really, you guys are a, a, a billion dollar university, and you're asking for some money for goalposts. They've got goalposts yeah. underneath the stadium ready to put up, so they don't need money for goalposts. It was a social media post that went awry in some ways. Let's put it that way. That's good. I'm glad you helped explain that. Appreciate great stuff, Brent. Enjoy it. And I know uh, UT Martin. Thanks for your time. We'll be in touch again soon. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Good stuff from Brent Hubbs, who uh, tries to summarize the weekend in Knoxville. When we co- 